Thank you for being part of Good Deeds Day. At the Birkat Hamazon, the blessing after the meal, we say Baruch Hazan et Hakol. Blessed is the one who feeds, who sustains all. It's true in the sense that God creates this providential brilliance around us of nature, as well as the creative resourcefulness of the human imagination in enabling seven plus billion people to coexist with all other species on the planet. It's not true, however, that we are always divine in how we approach it. Talmud Eruvin says that the sufferings of poverty cause one to lose their own sense, as in what's right and wrong, as well as to lose the sense of their maker. Poverty or hunger are theological and spiritual, as well as moral and political and economic concerns. There's much that we can do through organizations like Mazon with the help of Federation and its agencies. We can also make a difference individually in the choices that we make, including the efficiency of our diets by eating lower on the food chain and making sure that we respect the interconnected web of life, which ultimately is responsible for the food that we eat, as well as that we share with our neighbors. When we love our neighbor as ourself, we make sure that they are fed, and we make sure that we are not arrogating resources to ourselves beyond what is sustainable and beyond what enables the flourishing of all. Baruch Hazan et HaKol, blessed is the one who, with our help, ensures that all are fed. Welcome, everybody. How are you? Great to see you all. Thank you so much for joining us uh, and this wonderful event. We are live. Uh, that was a fantastic message from Rabbi Fred uh, from the Jewish Veg Rabbinic Council in D.C. We're going to come back to that message in a little bit, uh, but I want to introduce myself and uh, my co-hosts as well. So my name is Michael, and I'm the head of engagement and development at Jewish Veg. And uh, with me today are my co-hosts, uh, wonderful co-hosts, Sarah and uh, Scott. Sarah is the chair of um, outreach for the Jewish Veg chapter in DC. And Scott is the chair of advocacy uh, for DC. So welcome guys. Thank you so much. It's so great to be here. Thanks so much for having me. Great to see you here. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, we're excited to have all of you um, uh, with us, our audience, participating today. Uh, let us know where you're from in the chat um, and feel free to share how you're contributing to Tikkun Olam and repairing the world. Uh, this session is really designed to be interactive. Um, so welcome Mel uh, Melody from Charlotte, uh, North Carolina. Um, and uh, so please put your comments uh, just like that in, uh, um, and question, ask your questions live in the chat on the right uh, on Facebook and YouTube. That is enabled and we will pull your questions and comments into the stream and address them as uh, we go. Um, I, we've got a, a local audience We've got an international audience. I had a comment from uh, Anu from Rockville. Thank you so much for being here, for participating. Look forward um, to this as well. Uh, and I also, um, uh, Phyllis from Gaithersburg, great to see you. Thank you so much for being here. Um, and um, we've got, uh, yeah, and so I uh, also, oh, and also Tammy, yes, Tammy from San Diego, great to see you as well. Um, Joy from Maryland, fantastic. Thank you for joining us. Um, so local and national and international audience. Uh, we uh, also want to tell you guys about a giveaway that we are doing. So uh, you are going to see a uh, link to an impact survey at the bottom of the description of the event on YouTube and Facebook. And if you registered for the event, uh, you will also uh, see that in your inbox shortly after the event. If you could fill that out, um, you will be entered uh, to win uh, one of these two fantastic items uh, from a Jewish Veg. Uh, so uh, please uh, fill out that impact survey. Let us know uh, how um, this event is impacting you, how it's impacting the community. And this helps us a lot uh, tremendously in terms of um, 
uh, improving everything that we do at Jewish Veg. Uh, for uh, those of you um, who are uh, not part, uh, who have um, not uh, uh, heard about Jewish Veg a lot before, I want to just introduce this uh, kind of what we do as well. And I'll let you know, uh, for the past half century, Jewish Veg has really been the Jewish voice of the plant-based movement, one of the fastest growing social movements in the world. And our mission is to advance a plant-based lifestyle as an expression of Jewish values. So we really strive to create a kinder, healthier, more sustainable world uh, through the personal experiences, immersive experiences we create by building local communities, local compassionate communities, and by leading public campaigns. And all of this work is made possible only through the support of our partner organizations, um, like the Federation, uh, and for, with members like you who invest in our mission to build a kinder and healthier and sustainable world. If you've not become a member yet, you'll see the link right here at the bottom, and it'll be uh, uh, posted in the chat as well. Uh, please go to the link, um, support us, become a member of Jewish Veg, and it really sustains everything that we do um, for, for the community. Also want to let you know uh, this event is in partnership uh, with the Federation, uh, Good Deeds Week. Uh, the Jewish Federation uh, does Good Deeds Week uh, kind of on an annual basis now, um, and we are honored to be part of uh, this partnership with the Jewish Federation. If you're representing an organization that um, you think uh, should be partnered uh, with us, let us know, um, reach out to us, and we'll be happy to discuss ways that we can collaborate together because only through collaboration can we really advance and reach uh, more and more of our community. Uh, this event is also a, uh, is happening in sync with Earth Day. In a few days, we're gonna be experiencing Earth Day uh, and uh, this is an opportunity to reflect on everything that um, uh, that we do and how it impacts the earth and how it how we can um, uh, really take care of the earth that Hashem has given us. And um, in in doing that, you know, I, I think about a um, commandment um, called Baal Tashchit. So Baal Tashchit is a commandment in Deuteronomy that basically says that even in war, when your life is at stake, you cannot destroy the trees that, that uh, God has, has planted, that God has created. Um, uh, and, uh, and you have to be mindful of these trees. Uh, and so this is just kind of one instance of how mindful we have to be about all of the vegetation and everything that, that, um, uh, that Hashem has created to sustain us. And we, and, and as we're mindful of this, we also know that the Amazon, basically the lungs of the earth is literally burning uh, every day, uh, losing uh, uh, acres and acres because of the 200 million cows that are grazing there to, um, uh, to sustain them. And so they can be slaughtered and their meat can be shipped to Western countries like the United States. Um, so this is, uh, this is a great opportunity to focus on the impact of our food choices on our world and what we can do uh, individually and as a community to alleviate uh, global hunger and how it's all connected. As uh, Rabbi Fred uh, um, has said um, from our uh, rabbinic council, Baruch um, Ata Adonai is the is the blessing, Birkat uh, Hamazon, the blessing uh, on the food that we say every, um, every time we eat. Uh, we bless God, uh, who sustains all life. And we think about um, all, everyone that, that God sustains and our responsibility to be in partnership uh, with uh, God to sustain all life. And so to do this, uh, we have uh, to unpack all this. We have a fantastic uh, panel of speakers, Don, Lauren, Sonia, and Jonah, who will uh, guide us through uh, this uh, very important topic. And uh, first, I would like to introduce uh, Don, uh, who uh, is the founder and president of A Well-Fed World. And uh, I want to welcome you, Don, on the screen. Welcome, Don. Great to see you. Hi, great to be here. 
Fantastic. Well, this is, you know, such such a important topic. Uh, everything that we do impacts the earth, impacts uh, global hunger, impacts uh, the animals, the environment, our health. But I just want to start with, you know, kind of a, a personal question in terms of your food tradition growing up. What was that? Tell us what that was like and how did you come to embrace um, plant-based food and, and how did that all connect for you? Yeah, I've had it pretty easy. Uh, my mom was vegetarian when I was growing up. She still fed us meat and dairy and, you know, all the traditional foods. Uh, because she thought we needed it to grow up strong and healthy. But for her, for the animals, she was vegetarian. And so about 19, I became vegetarian once I was able to control my own food more. And uh, yeah, until that was 1998. And then in, that was 1989, 1989. In 1998, I became vegan uh, when, uh, someone explained to me, well, if you care about animals suffering, then you should care about dairy and eggs. She gave me a, a cassette tape to, to date myself a little bit of Michael Clapper. And uh, my first reaction was like, well, I'm not giving up pizza and ice cream, you know, for, for nothing. <laughs> right? Uh, uh, but once I researched it and then also realized how it was playing into my uh, work, uh, my graduate school work on uh, poverty and global hunger, uh, then it all just came together. And, you know, there was it, there was no downside except for the, the convenience factor, which, you know, was what we're trying to take care of. So, um, and then there was starting to be more and more pizza and ice cream. So we, we have it very easy, easy today. Back in my day, we didn't have such good pizza and ice cream vegan. It's true, you know, these days, like it's just so, you go to the store, you look in the aisles, there's more plant-based milk dairy milk, right? There's ice cream, cheese, I mean, Beyond Meat, I mean, oh, so many different options that it's just so much easier these days to, to go plant-based. Yeah, and my family's been so supportive. My mom is vegan now. My sister is vegan-ish. My niece is vegan-ish. And uh, so, it's, like I said, very easy for me. Fantastic. So tell us, how, how does this this choice that you, you, you clearly kind of made the transition. Um, how does the, this inspire you? How did this inspire you to found a well-fed world? And uh, tell us more about this organization and, and what you uh, what this does. Okay, yeah. Uh, well, originally, like I said, I was, I was up in DC at George Washington University and I planned to work you know, for the World Bank, you know, as, as you do, uh, to work on the poverty issues. But uh, then again, as I was researching it and then becoming aware of the, the benefits of plant-based foods. Uh, then I, I realized the concerns around the World Bank and also how nobody is really taking this approach. Uh, their understanding and the think tanks, uh, the International Food Policy Research Institute, which I credit for my work be, because they specifically would not advocate uh, demand-driven changes, uh, promoting mm -hmm. reduced consumption, even though they laid out all the concerns, uh, much like livestock's long shadow, actually, which is why there's so much attention to the climate benefits now. Uh, yeah, so then I shifted uh, into the, the vegan community and worked on the Hunger Connections as a campaign, as an educational campaign, until I was able to spin off into a program-based organization, A Well-Fed World, with our uh, flagship program being Plants for Hunger. And mm. with that, we offer an alternative to animal gifting programs in particular, you know, so like live animals or, or dead animals. Uh, <laughs> um, uh, but it's it's been really great in terms of Heifer International. Uh, when people look that up, they see us now because we have some work specifically against Heifer International, showing the concerns, even for meat eaters uh, or non-vegans, they still don't want to support the big organization. And so you can support as a vegan vegetarian, giving or receiving, and we give 100% to uh, groups on the ground doing doing the work. So we cover the administration and sometimes we can even match. So it's very easy to fundraise for this because it's not coming to us. You know, That's so amazing. we're just taking it and we're giving it away to these amazing groups that we've already vetted and know uh, very well. That's, that's really fantastic. 
Um, yeah, when you know, I remember when I was at Georgetown in DC um, and got involved in some international development work uh, with the Millennium Goals at that time, working um, a little bit with uh, some of the partners with World Bank. And I can see like we we made so much pro like in the lab that was back like 10, 15 years ago. But we made so much progress in terms of poverty alleviation on those millennium goals. But at what cost? Right. Like, I mean, all of the development that's happened in, in the developing world um, is how we really factoring in the environmental cost, the health related cost with obesity and chronic disease are just like shooting through the roof. Um, and it's, uh, it, you know, it, this development, it's just, it has to be, I think, looked at holistically, you know, just like this issue of, of food, it connects to so many different facets. Yeah, and we also do research. So if, if people are interested in learning more about that side of it, we have a lot of research on the website on, on climate, not a whole lot on nutrition, just enough to cover our basis, but food conversion, feed conversion ratios, which I, I know is something you're interested in. And uh, yeah, so awfw.org. If, if we could put that on the link uh, below um, so, so folks can access that, that's really, uh, that's really great. Lots of great information on your site. Um, thank you so much um, for all that. Um, I wanna ask you um, about, you know, specifically about food scarcity and global hunger. I know you touch on other issues as well. Um, but how serious is this issue of food scarcity and global hunger? This is one of the key things that uh, brought me to the work also in terms of the food inefficiencies uh, of, of feeding animals raised for food. It's extremely inefficient to, to cycle through. And probably a lot of your listeners already know that. Uh, just quickly, I'll plug again that we have feed conversion ratios. Why are we getting the back? Do you know what I can hear you. Oh, okay, it's not echoing. All right. Uh, feed conversion ratios are, are even more inefficient than, than people often realize. So in the veg community, we've often heard 16 to 1 for, for beef, that, it, that cows will eat 16 pounds of crops to produce one pound of beef. Mm. And that is not just a trading up. It's not just a, a calorie inefficiency, it's also a protein inefficiency. And that's a conservative number. So that's based on what's called live weight ratio, which is the size of the, the cow has to get. But it, once you um, take out the bones and the fluids and, and cut into, you know, sellable pieces, it's actually more like 25 to one. So we have that spelled out. And the same for uh, pigs is around nine to one, which is more than people think it, it are around four to one. Again, it's double, so it's double the triple what people often think. But okay, so what that does, then it uses up much more crops, obviously, than they would otherwise need to be used. And so the idea of scarcity versus distribution, it's not one or the other. It really needs to be considered a whole. And so there's a lot of pushback against the idea saying there's not food scarcity. And they just want to focus on distribution. And usually distribution means uh, infrastructure, roadways, being able to store the food and things of that nature. But we would talk about distribution as being part of the bringing the crops to animals, like that's a form of redistribution or maldistribution. And so that puts upward pressure on the food system. And if you just think of basic supply and demand, um, anytime you have a fixed supply or demand increases relative to supply, that's going to put upward pressure on prices, just like the reverse. If you have a sale and you have many people trying to buy a few items, um, uh, then you can increase the, the price. But if you have a bunch of items and only a couple of people, then you have to drop the price. Uh, don't want to get into that. It's not that easy and precise because there's a lot of other factors, but it puts upward pressure. It also is so destructive to the environment and the climate, as we know. So even if and scarcity is regional, right? So you can, if you talk about global scarcity, maybe there's not in terms of calories, but how it impacts regionally. Um, and then of course the, the climate and resource depletion and how that's heavily uh, felt by, by already low income and impoverished countries and those who can are at least resilient to, to be able to handle it. So even beyond scarcity and distribution, 
it's it's just, it's so harmful and devastating to to uh, those who are already suffering from poverty. And, and we've got a, a um, sorry, um, you know, we we've got a question here uh, from Coral from England. Um, is the solution for a world without hunger one where all food is grown on the earth and excludes the slaughter of animals uh, for food? It's part of the solution. So if we were to have a, a fully plant-based world, you know, and people will argue like if it's a vegan world, then that's going to come with ethics, right? But if it was a fully plant-based world, we still have to prioritize getting it to the, the people who care. So it is uh, moving towards a plant-based diet uh, is a necessary component. And I'm, I'm not going to say all plant-based because we have to at least move towards it just realistically. It has to be part of everybody's solution set that we should be promoting that. Um, again, for resource depletion, for climate, for, for crop use, for, for deforestation and photosynthesis, all of it. Uh, so it has to be part of the solution. Um, a fully plant-based world would do a tremendous amount to, to feed everybody, uh, but it doesn't just solve it all on its own. So you're you're saying that there's a direct connection, really, though, between our food choices and what happens in the world in terms of food scarcity, in terms of global hunger, um, and really we're impacting that through through the foods that we choose. Yeah, and obviously it's on an aggregate, so um, a lot of times individuals feel like, well, it doesn't matter because I'm just one person, right. and you know, that's you know, that's understandable and there's a lot of legitimacy, but what I would want people to focus on, you know, is uh, the going to the tipping point. And so it's not just your specific foods, but it's also the, the culture you're supporting, the, the friends and family and people you're around, the creating demand, which makes it easier for, for others uh, to be able to access the food and creating creating a, a culture where that's accepted and and celebrated and increasingly celebrated, whereas uh, consuming animal source products would be shunned. And moving in that direction, and that's realistic. It's not this, you know, this uh, this utopian ideal, uh, which is great to have is to pull and and to inspire us. But it, uh, you know, that's something that we can move towards. Much like smoking, right? So it used to be, oh, it's so fun, and now it's it's still around, but it's it's shunned. Yeah, um, that's that's exactly it. So, um, and and the ratios that you pointed out are really startling. I mean, if what you're saying is like 25, you you can produce 25 times more food by growing uh, plant based food as opposed to um, in investing those resources in like beef, you know, for example. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And again, it's not just calories. It's not, it's protein. It's, there's crop diversity, there's opportunity cost. And this was not, um, this, this is not a vegan group that came up with this research. It was Vaclav Schneel. He's a researcher. He's not even veg. <laughs> so, um, and still, but he's a researcher. So he still puts out the information. And that's also conservative if you were to take into account grazing, because that is still forage and calories that's being taken up. Those are opportunity costs. And, uh, you know, a lot of people don't count that. I wouldn't count that because we have the numbers on our side sufficiently, but some have counted it. And then it's just, you know, much higher than, than crops alone. I want to ask you about sustainable farming. You know, there's this, a lot of this um, talk about, um, you know, using animals in different ways. Maybe, you know, if we don't put them in factories and we, let them graze around and then they'll like distribute their fertilizer and you know it'll create sinkhole carbon sinkholes and things like that like what it, how does that factor in um, into the um, uh, efficiency equation yeah it's it's one of the it's it's a very i must say one of the biggest uh, misconceptions uh, but it you know it's actually heavily promoted so it's not just a, a misconception Grazing in terms of its climate impact is three to four times more greenhouse gas emissions, uh, methane in particular, uh, than animals who are factory farmed or fed crops. Uh, so the cereal crops uh, have less fiber when uh, cattle, uh, cows, lamb, sheep, when they're eating the grass, uh, which is their natural food, 
Um, but it, it is much more fibrous and they emit more methane through respiration. And that's three to four times uh, more than if they were fed cereal crops. And then of course, methane is a much, much stronger greenhouse gas. And one of the things we focus on at a well-fed world and really trying to draw attention to more and more is that pretty much any number you know is conservative. Any number coming from a mainstream source is gonna be conservative. So for those who are following this, they might know that methane is considered 20 to 25 times stronger than carbon dioxide as a greenhouse gas. I mean, that's immense. It's not double. If you said, oh, it's double, that's a lot, right? 10 times as long. 25, 20, 25 times stronger. You can't even really get your mind around how strong that is. And that's conservative. That's over a one year time span. Over a 20 year time span, it's around 85 times, give or take, 85 times more potent than greenhouse gases. And it also has a much shorter half life. So, and strength, we can get it out of the atmosphere. So one of the best ways that we could get our greenhouse gas emissions down quickly is by getting rid of methane or not, we can't get rid of methane, but you know, reducing, uh, eliminating uh, animals used for food and grazing in particular to, to get the methane out. And manure also, so any kind of carbon sequestration is so offset by by the methane. I mean, it, it's not even in the same category. I don't know how folks are talking about it the way they do. And then also the the deforestation that happens. So it has to be cleared, pasture has to be cleared and it only lasts so long, you gotta keep clearing it and uh, you're losing photosynthesis, which is one of our most natural ways to bring carbon dioxide out of the air. And there's, you know, they try to talk circles about it being a closed cycle. It's not the more animals you have, it overwhelms the any kind of natural cycle that there might be. You'd have to have much, much smaller numbers for there to be a natural cycle. Sorry, I know that's a lot of, of science, but on our website, and there's also coming soon, grazingfacts.org. We're working with the Center for Biological Diversity. Uh, it should be up maybe in a month or so, uh, grazingfacts.org. You know, that's, that's extremely um, educational because I think a lot of people don't realize this, you know, this, um, there's a lot of um, promotion, you know, around the, the idea of that, you know, we can, we can still eat meat if it's sustainable, it's fine. Um, but it, it sounds like, you know, any way you cut it, whether it's open pasture, organic, you know, reverse engineering, however you do it, it's all like, it's all causing tremendous amount of damage to the earth. Yeah. Um, it kind of goes back to, you know, um, to, uh, to Genesis uh, 129, the first, first book of Genesis, God gives man his diet and um, it is a plant-based diet. His, the fruits and the, and, the, and the vegetables and the seeds, that's where we are to eat. So when we try to be creative with that, how there are some serious consequences to this. Um, uh, what, so what, what, would you, what would you say, what would it mean for the world if we transition to a plant-based food system? Uh, and what would happen if things keep going the way they are? Well, you know, similar to what we were discussing before, just the, the, the climate benefits would be immense. The the natural resources we could uh, have rewilding, reforesting. Uh, the, you know, the other kind of opportunity costs we would have much more that we could we could feed people and nutritious food, nutrient dense food. Uh, you know, so it 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 would be all the world to, to be able to do that. Again, it doesn't fix everything. It's not a panacea. I'm, I'm speaking very realistically, not, you know, making it magic, but it even though it kind of is magic. Um, and you know, we're on a, a horrible trajectory. Uh, it's, it's not sustainable when I was doing this work in about, you know, the late nineties, uh, the, that international food policy research Institute, uh, paper, which was livestock to 2020 said he was going to be doubling. And I was like, there's no way. I mean, we can't, it just won't be sustainable, but it, it, it is doubling. Um, I mean, that was 50 billion animals when I first started this and now we're around 80 billion. And uh, that's animals, uh, it's different because they were going by weight, but it's, it's still very similar. And we're still on that trajectory going to, to 2050. 
Uh, and then uh, the only thing I've heard is that, that the industries that are working on the cellular meat and plant-based beef, uh, they've got um, some predictions that are really going to kind of push back against that. I don't, I don't know. Um, the, you know, I don't know the details of the research on that. Uh, I hope it does, but also that does not, that does not cure world hunger. So it has to be distributed and that's going to really be for higher income countries where it's available. But, uh, I'm, I'm still hopeful about it because, you know, it could just save billions of animals. Yeah. And in terms of, uh, the global hunger piece kind of helping to alleviate that, um, by, uh, advancing towards a, a plant-based uh, food system. I mean, that um, there, there's also the issue of land uh, distribution, right? Like you've got so much land that's being used to grow all these animals and it takes so long. Um, how, it, how, how does that break down for you? Well, a lot of it is in these, you know, lower income countries uh, where the industrial, the you know, the multinational corporations, which are often tied into the high income countries. Uh, I'm getting distracted by the comments. Okay. Um, yeah, so they're, they're coming in and they're coming in under the guise of, of feeding people more and the local communities in particular, but they actually undermine food security in those areas because they're uh, creating jobs which impact for men mostly uh, which empower men and disempower the women who are otherwise doing a lot of the food production. Uh, so there's a lot of ideas that women are doing food preparation and, and they are, but they're also doing a lot of the food production. And when women control the, the food and financial resources, it much more gets spent on family and for children. If that's just the way it is. Um, and so by bringing, uh, men into the picture and giving them the financial resources and, and disempowering women, uh, there's, there are significant uh, drawbacks to that. And then of course the, the, the pollution that happens, uh, the, the animal processing, there's gonna be slaughterhouses there. It's, it's, it's horrible on workers, as much as it's horrible in the US on, on slaughterhouse workers, uh, you can imagine it's, it's much worse even, even um, in the, the lower income marginalized communities. Fantastic. Thank you so much for breaking that down for us. Uh, it's, so, it's so powerful to, to know that all these things are so interconnected um, that our food choices have such a huge impact collectively um, on, on the world and can, uh, can address all these pertinent issues, security, global hunger, certainly the environment. <laughs> um, so I uh, really appreciate um, really appreciate you doing that. S stay tuned for the discussion that we'll have at the end. Um, and I will, uh, thank you so much, uh, Don. And I'm going to bring on uh, Sarah, our uh, co-host, um, and uh, Lauren, and uh, we will be introducing uh, Lauren as well. Thank you so much, Michael. Hi, Lauren. Hi, Sarah. Hi, Sarah. Good to see you. Likewise. When Michael asked me to do this and he said, would you be willing to talk with Lauren? I was like, Lauren is a mentor and such an inspiration in my life. So I feel very honored to be here and talk with her today. And she's the founder of the Food Empowerment Project um, and has done so many incredible incredible projects in her work and her life that is very inspiring. So I'm very grateful to have her in my life. Um, but today we're gonna talk about the Food Empowerment Project and your work. And so first I was wondering if you could share about your personal food journey and why you decided to embrace veganism. Sure. Um, so I actually, I grew up in Texas. And so I actually went vegetarian in the 70s. Um, because when I was about four or five, uh, because um, this is a long story, but basically my parents were getting a divorce. And I think that seeing the cows in the fields and knowing my family was having to be separated, that I didn't want to contribute to their separation. I didn't want to feel responsible for why the mama didn't come home to her baby or vice versa. 
So I went vegetarian when I was really little. Um, and I remember being in line in the cafeteria at the elementary school and them asking if uh, I wanted meat on my enchiladas. And I said, no, I don't eat, you know, I don't eat meat. And they asked me if I was a vegetarian. And I had never even heard the term before. And so I thought she was saying veterinarian. And so I was like, why does this woman think I'm a veterinarian? I mean, it was just like very straight. It's this very foreign word to me. Um, so, you know, I stuck with being um, vegetarian as long as I could. We didn't have a lot of mo money growing up. So I eventually had to go back to eating animals. Um, but by the time I was 16, I went back to being vegetarian. And then in 1988, I went vegan um, permanently. And so, uh, you know. That's my vegan journey, basically. It involves other human rights issues as well, just like Food Empowerment Project does. As somebody who is raised with uh, understanding the boycott against grapes uh, on behalf of farm workers, um, being a very proud Hicanix, meaning I'm very proud Mexican, um, that uh, respects my indigenous roots. Um, I, my family, you know, my mom raised me with an understanding of farm worker justice. So that was always part of my veganism, as was looking at food as a tool for social change. Thank you. And that actually is perfect segue because I wanted um, to ask you to talk about your work at the Food Empowerment Project, um, your work with farm workers. And maybe if you could just explain a little bit more about um, what, how your work at the Food Empowerment Project on food is connecting with your work with uh, farm workers. Sure. So, I mean, we see that as a vegan organization, we are encouraging more people to consume more plants, more fruits and vegetables. And as somebody who went vegan because I didn't want to contribute to the suffering of non-human animals, it just makes perfect sense to me. But I also don't want to contribute to the suffering of human animals as well. So part of our work is really trying to get people to um, not contribute, you know, basically put it this way, we can't not eat produce, right? Vegan or not, everybody's going to need produce. So we need to do our best to fight in the way for the rights of farm workers. And much of that is honoring the boycotts called by farm workers themselves, which includes the coalition of Immokalee workers asking people to boycott Wendy's in Publix, if you're in the Southeast, as well as the um, San Quintin farm workers in Mexico who are asking us to boycott Driscoll's. Um, we also, you know, we were successful in changing a regulation in California um, that was impacting the education of the children of farm workers. But probably the most thing that we do that everybody can help with is we do an annual school supply drive for the children of farm workers. And we do this every year. Um, this year, we're going to be doing the drive in June, the entire month of June. And basically what we do is we, we used to, before COVID, we would have the drop off locations throughout the the Bay Area, California, which is where our, our headquarters is, um, and have people mail school supplies to us. But because of COVID, um, we're asking people to only mail us backpacks and then send us money, and then we're gonna be the ones buying the school supplies to limit contamination. Um, and this year, because of COVID as well, we found out, which I'm sure a lot of you parents know, is that the water fountains aren't working at schools right now. And so a lot of these children are going to need water bottles. They don't have, you know, they don't have things like water bottles. So we're actually going to be trying to raise money to be able to provide all the kids with a water bottle with their backpacks. And we don't see this as an act of charity. We see this as a, a way to right an injustice that's taking place to farm workers. And we see it as well as a way to basically thank, thank the farm workers for feeding us and telling their, the kids what superstars they are. Amazing. And that's a really great point about the water bottles. So I, I thank you for sharing, especially about that. Um, I have a question. Um, this goes back to another amazing project you're doing at the Food and Empowerment Project. But in terms of, you know, I would love to hear your definition of healthy food and building communities where healthy food is available. And part of that is um, I'd love for you to be able to share about your Safeway campaign and how that is connected to the idea of communities being healthy and having access to good foods? Sure. I mean, my idea of, of healthy food is one that doesn't, it eliminates as much as possible the suffering of human and non-human animals. Um, so that would mean um, a vegan diet. And also for me, vegan, it includes not just those whom we consume, but everything about not exploiting non-human animals. Um, but in addition to that, 
Um, it includes foods that are culturally appropriate. It includes foods that are fresh foods for people. And unfortunately, I think that that's sometimes something that vegans forget is that not everybody has access to healthy foods. And I think the best example, not to bring up COVID again, but again, we are still in the midst of the pandemic, that many times a lot of us went to the grocery store. And for the first time when we went, we weren't able to find the foods that we wanted to eat. And in black and brown and indigenous communities across the United States, this happens on a regular basis. This is how they live their lives. Many people are buying their foods from convenience stores and liquor stores and gas stations. And so they don't have that same access to fresh produce. That's why it's not easy for everybody to go vegan. Um, and we have our Safeway campaign because we found that in one of the communities we're working in, that Safeway, which was located in a black and brown area, as well as where a lot of seniors were living, had moved from that location, relocated miles away, and put what's called a restrictive deed on their former property, preventing any grocery store from moving in for 15 years, essentially depriving that community from having access to healthy foods. Um, we found out this is taking place across the country. The restrictive, actually, there's one in Washington, D.C., that a city council member there has been fighting constantly to try to get Safeway not to harm the health of her community members. So we actually have a petition on our website that we're asking people to sign. We have activists who go out in front of Safeway locations, which is Vons and Lucky's and Randall's, a whole bunch of different names, and to ask Safeway to stop this um, policy. Um, and we've had lots of activists in Washington, D.C. go out, especially because this is the problem there. Um, and, you know, this is this is where we know that lack of access to healthy foods is sometimes a deliberate attempt to harm the health of black and brown and indigenous communities. Oh, sorry, I had to unmute myself, sorry. <laughs> um, well, you talked, um, you mentioned one thing um, in terms of, um, um, this is something we had talked about, you had introduced me to this term lactose normal. And I'm gonna preface this by saying, um, Michael provided this statistic for me, that 75% of all Jewish people cannot digest milk products. And this mirrors, um, essentially the demographics of other groups around the, um, around the world. And um, so what traditionally um, people would say is that they're lactose intolerant. And so, um, you know, there's a requirement by the USDA that every school lunch have a little uh, thing of milk on the lunch trays, for example. So this is an incredibly wasteful thing And when you're talking about school lunches. And then Lauren introduced me to, it's not lactose intolerant, it's lactose normal. So I'd love for you to share about this and just other, other verbiage that we've been using. Sure. I think that, yeah, we decided to, you know, th the term lactose intolerant implies there's something wrong with us. Um, who can't digest cow or goat milk. When in reality, there's two things to that. One is that it's not normal for anybody to be consuming the milk of another species. So how normal is that that pe some people can do it? It's more normal that you don't. Um, and also for people like me who, you know, my ancestors are indigenous to the Americas. Um, Columbus brought the cows over on his fourth voyage. So it's actually a product of colonization. And to act as if there's something wrong with us because we can't digest this milk is not recognizing the legacy that colonization still has on many peoples around the globe. So we kind of like looking at it as that it's lactose normal to not be able to digest the milk of another species. So, yeah, thanks for asking about that. It's very important how we look at our, I feel very important how we look at words. And I hope that lactose normal becomes the de facto term. It's something that I've been using now and I think it's great. And I also agree, like why, as an aside, why would anyone want to consume the milk of another animal? So Thank it does not make sense. So- And you think about people in cultures around the world too. They, they've been drinking like coconut milk. I mean, it, there's other milks out there, rice milk. I mean, so it's, again, I feel this like very colonization kind of thing, so. Yes, very much so. And also, just as an aside, you know, as I said before, the USDA requires all school lunches to have milk served to every every student in the United States. And this is again forcing um, a dietary habit onto tens of millions of children that <laughs> do not want this. So, yeah. So, um, 
Yes. And there are, I've been making my own milks at home lately and they're just so delicious. And at the store, there's obviously a plethora of amazing milks that are available too. So, um, my last question is I'd love for you to share, um, about food choices that each person can make that leaves a positive footprint on the world. And maybe you could share like a favorite recipe or two, and also tell people, um, where we could get more recipes from food empowerment project. Sure. Um, I'm now I'm trying to like, what was the first half of that? I knew the recipes and I was like, oh yeah, recipes. Um, oh, the other food. So basically, so on Food Empowerment Project's website, foodispower.org, which is actually available in English and Spanish. And um, we have like a top 15 things you can do. And obviously if you have access to healthy foods, one is to go vegan. Another thing is to try to buy organic when you can. I know it's expensive, but at least it means one less bad thing happening to farm workers. If you're vegan, you know that just because it's cage free or grass fed, it doesn't really mean the animals are treated better. It doesn't necessarily mean that farm workers are treated any better, but it does mean that at least they're not being doused with agricultural chemicals. Um, we also have on our website, our chocolate list. Um, we are trying to discourage people from buying chocolate that's sourced from where the worst forms of child labor, including slavery take place. So we have a list of chocolates we do and do not recommend on our website why we recommend them, why we don't recommend certain companies. And every company on the list has to make at least one vegan chocolate to make our list. Um, and we also have a free app that you can download as well for your iPhone or your Android. You can download a free app. Um, and in terms of recipes, um, I'm very excited that just this week we launched um, vegan Lao food. One of our board members is Lao. So we just launched vegan Lao food. It's in English right now, but hopefully in the next month, it'll also be available in Lao. We have um, vegan Mexican food, which is in English and in Spanish, nod to my people. Um, we also have vegan Filipinx food um, for my colleague who is Filipina, and that's in English and in Tagalog. Um, in terms of my favorite recipes, I don't really cook. Like if you asked me to make something for you, I'd probably make you popcorn or beans on toast. Um, my, my partner does all the cooking, um, but I do, um, in terms of our websites, I. One of the foods that I grew up eating all the time on vegan Mexican food is fideo. And so if you've never tried fideo, maybe give it a shot. Amazing. And we will, I love cooking, but I do love making popcorn too. So often <laughs> we'll have to popcorn topping recipes. Yeah. So. Awesome. Thank you so much, Lauren. I've just been looking at all the comments and obviously your work is so inspiring and like i said lauren has been such an inspiring mentor to me and there's so much to learn from her and her colleagues at food empowerment so thank you to jewish veg for allowing me to interview lauren and for having lauren today here today and just to show the amazing work that she's doing so yes thank you all for having me and for interest in this topic and sarah thanks for all that you do for so many and if you haven't checked out her work please check out Sarah's work for the kangaroos and even check out how she saved a little toad recently. Fantastic. Thank you so much, uh, Sarah, Lauren. Thank you so much for um, this fantastic conversation. Uh, it really adds so much to, uh, to all of our work. Really appreciate it. And uh, stay tuned for uh, the discussion afterwards. All right. Um, so uh, with that, I want to introduce uh, Sonia, who is uh, the Director of Social Justice and Volunteer Programs at the DC JCC. Welcome, Sonia. Thank you so much for having me. It's great to see you. And thank you so much for being a part of this. The DC JCC is one of our um, fantastic partners. When we actually first launched, uh, the DC chapter of Jewish Veg, um, but uh, uh, I guess two years ago or something like that, um, we had that first like launch event at uh, the DC JCC uh, on Sukkot. So that was a fantastic, um, a fantastic community, and I always, uh, I always loved the the JCC. I used to work in the Virginia JCC, and uh, it's just such an integral part of you know Jewish life. So I want to ask you about um, kind of what draws you to the social responsibility work that you're leading at the JCC. And um, how do you see this work connecting to our Jewish food traditions? 
Um, thank you for the question. So um, I, it, what, dri what drives me and what has always driven me is um, just a pursuit of um, more justice in the world. My background is in social work um, and I have a lot of, um, I've been lucky to have enough, a lot of experiences um, doing social justice work um, in various communities through various actually Jewish organizations. Um, and, you know, back in um, fifth grade, I was like the chair of our Tzedakah committee. <laughs> Um, so it's apparently always been with me. Um, my brother is like an entrepreneur, uh, big bank person. So um, my parents, I don't know um, what happened there. But, um, but I've just always, um, I've always known that what I want to do um, is, is um, at least uh, work towards more justice in the world. Um, and I think uh, this is a deeply Jewish, this is a deeply Jewish thing. Um, and um, my Jewish identity is wrapped um, tightly into uh, my desire to create justice in the world for for um, for a living or to really inspire others to create justice in the world, which is what I do. Um, and so as far as the, the, the food traditions, I mean, everyone knows like um, our, all of our traditions involve food um, heavily. And our, um, we have a lot of beautiful traditions um, involving food and all of our holidays, except for, of course, Yom Kippur, involve food in some way. Um, but there's also, um, you know, Michael, you mentioned this a little bit in the beginning, but there, um, there's also a lot of mention of both agriculture on the one hand and um, sort of issues of hunger on the other in the Bible, which, you know, sort of trickles down in some way to what our tradition looks like today and what Jewish identity looks like today and, um, you know, uh, whatever your range of beliefs, but, you know, uh, biblical stories can help shape um, our narrative today. And there's the, the book of Ruth, which is very important. Um, we're supposed to leave, you know, our fields um, fallow um, and let them rest. Um, we're not supposed to cut down trees. Um, and then on the other side, over on the on the hunger side, right? It, um, it's a central um, sort of value in the in the Bible to to feed those who uh, might experience hunger. Um, and so I think there's um, really strong links there. Yeah, in the in the Bible and in the Torah, I always I see. The mention, like when when it talks about tzedakah, when it talks about charity and giving, um, the stranger is always first. Like feed the stranger, then the widow, and then the orphan. Um, so like even as we think about food, like it seems like it's it's a uh, food is part of the social justice kind of you know theme as well. That tzedek tzedek tirdof, justice you will pursue. Um, and as we feed ourselves, first think of others and and how we can help and feed them. Yes, absolutely. Well, you know, I mean, we think I think of social responsibility as a really expansive notion. So we have the um, Morris Kayford Center for Social Responsibility at the JCC, and um, we really offer you a wide range of ways to engage with the concept of social justice or social responsibility, which I like better, um, actually, than the term social justice. Um, and so, and food is really central. I mean, essentially everything Lauren just said right before me, right? Um, helps explain why um, food is such an important part of social responsibility, but folks can come at their passion um, and at, you know, their desire to create change in the world in a very, in a wide variety of ways. Um, it's just, you know, we think of this piece as food insecurity. The thing we, the thing, the piece we really address um, is food insecurity. But of course, again, as the um, wonderful speakers before me have pointed out, um, it's, it's all very interconnected. Yeah, and food, you know, in American Jewish life, especially, um, people experience Judaism through food. You know, they go to Shabbat meals, they go to the um, uh, Passover meal. They, you know, it, it's kind of like integral in everything that we do. Um, and uh, I think sometimes we kind of just take it for granted. Like we just, you know, this is what we, this is Jewish food. This is what, you know, what we eat. Um, and I wonder what, what we can do um, as a community to promote mindfulness around our food choices and advance a deeper appreciation of how our food choices impact, you know, you know, the world around us and the impact that we want to create in the world. Well, the first thing I wanted to say, which actually is not like directly related to your question, is that um, 
we're a very Ashkenazi normative community here in the in North America, I would say, and our understanding of what Jewish food is is actually very limited. And really, most of the time, folks think of um, middle. Um, Eastern European foods, which are a very meat heavy, but B also just, you know, they're, uh, they're a specific set of cuisine. And um, the first thing I would just encourage people is to just expand their understanding of what Jewish food really is. And if you think about um, the Jewish communities of North Africa and the Middle East, um, even just, you know, just stopping in South America, um, those communities um, have very different food traditions, uh, even just something as simple as, you know, with a Passover, you know, Passover and what your Seder plate at Passover looks like um, and other many, many other things. So I just first I would say, you know, if, if we were to expand our understanding of what Jewish food is traditionally, we would already, I think, include some more plant based options <laughs> to begin with. But um, again, so I think inherent, you know, in um, Jewish identity for many folks, and I would encourage everyone to um, to do this is 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 social responsibility, is some responsibility to our neighbor um, and direct neighbor, neighbor across the country, neighbor across the world, um, but to to others. And within within that um, is making food choices. And so one way to express um, Judaism's, you know, heavy imperative for social justice and for change in the world is through making food choices. And um, I think that can be done in a variety of ways, but what Lauren mentioned with chocolate can be said about a number of um, different food groups. Um, if you want to look at your coffee being shade grown um, and bird friendly, um, there's just some, some, you know, like um, if you want to cut out um, meat once a week, twice a week, you know, rather than if you're, if you are a daily meat eater, I think there's um, incremental steps, but also just um, consumer choices you can make. And um, I encourage folks to think about that as a Jewish act, because again, like, um, you know, we strive um, certainly to take care of the planet um, and to take care of each other. And part of that is making the the food choices that we make. And, and that is something we have a lot of control over versus what corporations might be doing, um, what kind of greenhouse gases um, might be emitted by really, really, you know, by what coal is doing. Like those are not things we have control over, but I would, you know, but I would say like food choice is actually um, something we have direct control over. Um, I would, I would just also mention something also, I just, you know, I think just Lauren really said all of all of it <laughs> before me. But what I would encourage, um, you know, it, when we're talking about our choices is also, um, you know, lobbying and advocating for and getting involved in movements that bring fresh food to um, food deserts and areas that don't have it right here in D.C. So D.C. Um, has a has a you know, we really have a large split um, when it comes to the Anacostia River and east of the river and west of the river and what the DC map looks like when it comes to um, food distribution and food access of, um, and particularly when you're talking about organic or, I mean, I think, you know, those words don't even enter the vocabulary of a lot of folks um, in in our city. So even just right here in DC, um, you, you can just think about not directly your own food choices, but what can you do um, to enhance the food choices um, that other folks can make? Yeah, just kind of um, to emphasize that there is a lot of inequity, you know, in our food system. Um, and, you know, just look at the, you know, racial the demographics of these food deserts. You know, the people that are really hurt by this, you know, just like when you look at COVID and uh, chronic diseases and other things um, are the underrepresented uh, populations uh, uh, throughout throughout America. So that's certainly true in DC, uh, you know, as it is in other um, major cities. Well, thank you so much. Um, stay tuned for our uh, discussion and um, really appreciate all of the work that you're doing in the JC, uh, JCC of DC, the Mecca of Jewish life in uh, mm -hmm. our nation's capital, I, absolutely. Um, and uh, with that, I wanna uh, bring on um, Scott, uh, and uh, welcome, Scott. Uh, Scott is uh, the chair of our advocacy work uh, in the in DC, um, and uh, he is going to be uh, speaking uh, with uh, Jonah.
All right. Hey, Jonah, how are you? Hey, Scott, I'm doing well, thanks. How are you? I'm doing all right, thank you. Um, so you are, excuse me, you are the co-founder and director of strategic marketing at Plant Burger. Um, yeah, and I think Dawn earlier mentioned like how much easier it is these days to be vegan. And even in the last, I feel like five years from my own eating habits in DC especially, it's like the vegan scene here is amazing and there's so many good options. Um, obviously Plant Burger is very much contributing to that. So what got you involved in that? And if you, would you want to speak a little bit about um, how Plant Burger got started, where it's going and uh, what excites you about, you know, being involved in veganism? Sure. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I also first want to just say um, how honored I am to be a part of this conversation. Uh, it's just been really great hearing um, Don, Lauren and Sonia share their thoughts and uh, I think they've said a lot of what I was planning to say. So, but they said it so beautifully that I don't want to uh, reiterate it. I'll just um, share my thoughts on on the business and the mission, uh, which tends to actually overlap um, with all of their organizations in uh, in significant ways. Uh, so, as you said, we are uh, a startup restaurant concept called PLNT Burger. You said Plant Burger. We're actually kind of rebranding and going in the direction of Planet Burger. Um, but because we've left our name as PLNT, it's intentionally ambiguous so that people can create their own experience and definition for our concept. Uh, for people who are already plant-based, it's easier to think of it as plant burger, great. Um, but our mission is really to democratize delicious, planet-friendly, plant-based or planet-based food for everyone uh, and celebrate, as you said, the moment that we're arriving at in the evolution of food technology. Never before has it been so enjoyable and delicious and flavorful to live uh, as a vegan um, and as someone who grew up eating many hamburgers and thought of that as always my favorite food when i became vegetarian at a young age it was indeed a sacrifice to give up those uh favorite comfort foods but i'm now able to indulge in them and enjoy them every day and uh they've reached such a high level of um flavor texture and and likeliness um, to their animal-based counterparts that it's now just a seamless transition from being an omnivore or enjoying animal products to living in a, a plant-based or vegan diet. So uh, yeah, so um, that's sort of at a high level what we're all about. Uh, our mission is to eat the change you wish to see in the world and to recognize and empower people to, to understand that your food choices are actually one of the biggest ways that you have um, an impact on the environment and on the future of the planet and to take those choices seriously and uh, and to implement our values and to be consistent with what we believe and what we say and what we do and what we put in our bodies. So um, I'm really proud to be a part of this mission and, and this company and uh, and continue to grow. It's amazing. Yeah, I, I, I love that uh, plant and planet uh, wordplay. Like that's actually really smart. Um, yeah, so what kind of grew your own consciousness about the food system and made you want to sort of transition into, you know, plant-based eating? Yeah, it's a good, good question. Um, it started out as a child when, uh, my family took me to an animal sanctuary and I quickly fell in love with the chickens, the roosters, the cows, the goats, um, and all the character that they exhibited made me realize, you know, these are phenomenal creatures that are indeed sentient, emotional, and um, want to do really the same thing that we as humans crave in life. They want to be with their family. They want to be in nature uh, and to be respected. And um, and then we went home and had El Pollo Loco. And I was like, there's something that didn't match up. And uh, I remember asking my parents, is this chicken the same chicken that we saw on the farm? They said, well, it's a different chicken, but it's, it's actually the same animal. And uh, that's sort of the beginning of my journey. And I started to delve deeper into this cognitive dissonance and the disconnect between our love for animals and our desire to save the planet and what we're putting on our plates and in our bodies. And, um, and so I, I became you know, more and more interested. And I was just 10 at the time. So I started watching these YouTube videos and uh, learning about factory farming, it was a traumatic experience, but um, often, you know, those 
chaotic and traumatic moments uh, are pivotal for our development as people. So um, I remember uh, just being disturbed by what I what I was learning, and it made me passionate about understanding more about food systems. And uh, ultimately, that was what pushed me to study food policy, uh, political science, and work on farms of all different shapes, sizes, and, and ultimately to get involved in uh, the natural food industry. And um, I've worked in sustainability for my, my whole life. But uh, another really pivotal moment was, was actually working in slaughterhouses in Colorado and seeing um, the trauma that we inflict on people who have to work in those factories. Um, they suffer from PTSD. It's one of the most dangerous uh, occupations. And the fact that we're so disconnected as consumers that we can just pay for a product and we don't understand the social impact, the economic impact, the environmental impact, and the fact that we're taking a life um, is really problematic and it has landed us in a difficult place um, in all of those areas. And so I think that the more we're able to connect to the impact our choices have and to understand um, how to move in the right direction uh, and embrace more plant friendly, uh, pl planet friendly and planet based foods, fungi included, uh, then the, the better we'll be able to actuate our beliefs. That's so true. I mean, it's so true that like once you realize the massive amount of connections that your choices, your eating choices actually connect to, it's like that I think brings about the sort of cognitive dissonance that you were mentioning, you know, like, oh, there are workers that are behind this food and it comes from somewhere it's transported. There's energy costs in that. It's, and then like the water, everything. So it's like very, uh, it's amazing. And, and I, I love, uh, that's the same like planet, planet idea. It's like everything is completely uh, intertwined. Um, all right, so I actually bought some planet burger food. So you got my uh, barbecue burger. And uh, I think it's the barbecue bacon mushroom burger actually. So I'm gonna try this. I feel like a YouTube like food reviewer right now, but. <laughs> Awesome. Yeah, enjoy. Uh, but tell mm. on. <laughs> right. I'll also just share one, one of the more interesting uh, and intersectional menu items that we offer um, at the intersection of uh, planet friendly foods and addressing the issue of food waste is what we call our crispy chicken fungi sandwich. And that's actually made from the root base of an oyster mushroom, a product that would otherwise be discarded uh, and become agricultural waste. Um, and, and we and our chefs have worked to steam it and prep it in the right way and uh, and to make it um, just a delicious chicken breast alternative. So um, throughout the month of Earth Month, if, if anyone who's listening in is in the DMV area or in Philly, we're offering those um, sandwiches for three ninety five dollars for the duration of Earth Month. Great. Um, it was very delicious bite, by the way. And uh, thank you. It, it actually really does capture that, like, I don't want to say like American fast food feeling, but you know what I mean? Just that, like, it feels exactly the same as when you, before you sort of became aware of how destructive all these fast food practices were, when like the, the way those foods taste, it's very good. Um, so thank you. And I'm gonna, I might take a sip of my uh, strawberry rhubarb drink because it's like still in my. Yeah, and in the meantime, <laughs> I see that Alicia uh, has asked the question, do we have it in Los Angeles? Not yet, but um, we do intend to grow our, our brand and uh, spread our concept throughout um, throughout the United States. And uh, I know that LA and California is really progressive and uh, ready for this sort of concept. So uh, I think it would thrive in LA and, uh, and in California. We, we look forward to growing more on this coast uh, on the west coast sorry yeah i think la would it would explode in la for sure um so what but beyond kind of planet burger itself like what do you see as the future of plant-based food sort of globally like what do you see happening in the next decade or so yeah so i think that we're at the very beginning of a revolution in our food systems uh, and particularly with regard to animal meat alternatives. Um, we as humans have incredible ingenuity and the power to 
achieve our, our goals, whether that be sending people into space or coming up with a vaccine to a virus that, you know, was an amazing turnaround. We can, and <laughs> frankly, animal meat is not going to advance any more than it already has. It's kind of done what it, it can do. And we also know that it, the only reason we love it is because of its flavor, not because of any of the other downsides, right? We, we don't eat it because it has a bad impact on people and the planet. We eat it because it's part of our cultures and identity and we, we crave that flavor, but all that flavor comes from seasoning. And in fact, all meat starts with plants. So if we, as humans, can reconceptualize meat based on its component pieces rather than its origin, it doesn't have to come from animals. It's protein, it's fats, it's trace minerals, it's water, all of that, you know, by definition came from plants. That's how those animals built up their tissue. Uh, and so the more that food scientists experiment with different plants and fungi and blend them and identify which pieces are creating those textures and flavors of meat, uh, the better we'll, th these products will become. And I, I really think that within the next three to five years, we'll have more meat products, more plant-based meat products than we ever have. And they will be not only better in uh, price and flavor than meat, but of course in, in health and environment, environmental impact as well. So uh, it, it can only go up from here. And uh, I'm really proud to be working with chefs who are at the forefront of pioneering uh, delicious planet-friendly, planet-based foods. Yeah. It's so exciting. Like it really is. And when you even eating this now, it's like, wow, this is so cool that we are as crazy as everything is. Like we're so fortunate that sort of it's a great opportunity where everything like this is coming together that we can sort of think differently about food and advance it in these like incredibly creative ways, you know? Yeah, absolutely. And, and that's really what's been woven into our marketing and our, our mission statement is this is an upgrade, not a sacrifice. And I think there's a stigma, right? There's like this mindset and pe people have preconceived notions that if you're going to be a vegan or, or you're gonna have a plant-based diet, that somehow you're gonna lose, you're gonna miss out on your favorite foods. And for the first time ever in food history, that's not the case. It's actually an upgrade. You can eat your burger, we, we say have your burger and eat it too. It can be an incredibly empowering and uplifting experience when you sink your teeth into a delicious burger that didn't require any death or suffering and you feel the energy as well. It's much cleaner. And I remember, you know, eating those animal meat burgers in my past and just you feel sluggish and, and heavy and you have to take a siesta. It's like, no, we can eat three burgers and go for a five mile run. And uh, you feel cleaner and, and um, enjoy all of the benefits of not having cholesterol, not having products that are going to have a high likelihood of diet related illness and all of those benefits. Um, so I'm very optimistic about the future of food technology and plant-based uh, foods in general. Definitely, yeah, I completely agree. And uh, I think that's about all we have. So thank you so much. I really appreciate it. It's incredible what you guys are doing and uh, what you are doing. And thank you. Thank you, Scott. Thank you so much, guys. Uh, this has been fan fantastic and incredible. I wanna bring um, our other uh, speakers on as well. Um, so that uh, we can uh, we can have uh, some kind of uh, closing out comments and uh, discussions. Anything that you guys want to add? Um, we we had a few questions uh, that kind of um, popped up that folks have submitted. Laurie from New York, you know, what can we do? Um, Alex from Alexandria, um, uh, local to DC here. Uh, who? How can we uh, make sure that no one is hungry? Um, what do you guys think? How what what would uh, what would be some viable solutions that individuals uh, can uh, take to um, ensure that we live in a world that is sustainable uh, and in a world um, where um, hopefully we can move you know towards a world uh, truly without hunger. I guess I'll start. Uh, I, don't, I don't have an easy answer for that at the individual level, but just like we were saying before, really getting to the tipping point. So you do, if people remember that, just like we say with gay marriage, right? You don't, we don't have to get all the way, but we get to a tipping point and it'll happen much faster. And then um, as people in the US, we have much more influence 
And then we influence our, our direct community, which helps put pressure on policymakers and makes economic incentives. I think it when you look at lack of access to healthy foods, especially in black and brown and indigenous communities, one of the things that you can do is fight for living wages. And because we need more equity in this country, and that isn't going to change until we we force it. So really advocating for living wages for all workers, fast food, restaurant, grocery store workers, as well as on the city, state, federal level, we need to push for living wages. And I'll just say that one of the biggest problems with the global hunger, especially in the global south, it is politics. So that is a, a bigger issue. But we can definitely look in our own backyards and try and do something about the problems here that's created by our governments. So this is can kind of connected to what you just said, uh, Lauren. Uh, Robin from LA is asking, what are your suggestions for communicating effectively with legislators, local and federal? Do you want me to take that one too? Go ahead. Uh, I'll say that I think that we're much better off focusing on our local legislators than we are federal legislators. We can reach out to um, your federal legislator, you may or may never hear back, but if you reach out to your city council member, you can have a bigger impact. I will say that anybody who has children, it also includes getting involved in your local PTAs or your school boards um, to really make a difference um, at every local level that you possibly can. I just want to add that also you don't have to do it alone or as an individual and that I would really encourage you to join a campaign that exists that has power behind it already and that is working in coalition with other organizations. Um, so my um, fellow speakers here certainly are working on those campaigns. So fi find um, an organization that already has created um, some of that political power and um, has um, um, rapport with um, legislators and you can j just join and um, usually folks like that have very easy um, first steps for, you know, for engagement in campaigns like that. Fantastic. Yeah. Um, thank you, Alicia. Uh, we have a uh, Jewish veg uh, chapter in several uh, places throughout the U.S. and growing. Um, we've got a chapter in New York, a chapter in D.C., a uh, chapter in LA and a new chapter uh, in the Bay Area, San Francisco Bay Area as well. Um, these are local communities that are um, uh, really coming together and experiencing you know, uh, Judaism in a compassionate way. Um, this is another question it looks like from Michael in Vancouver, uh, Canada. As a Jew, how do I approach people in different faiths? Um, talking about um, compassionate way, talking about veganism, um, any um, any suggestions on that, or I can comment a few things there. I'll share an idea here. I think uh, as Jews, we have a certain set of values and beliefs that are not unique to Judaism. Um, ideas of Chesed, Barachamim, Rabim, and Tzedek, and uh, the idea of Tikkun Olam are actually universal concepts of loving kindness and mercy for others. Uh, and so if we start at those basic ideas and, um, and move from there, then I think you know, we can make it more palatable and relatable for people. Um, and just explaining, you know, a lot of the, the statistics uh, that were already discussed here and some, some of the most um, compelling reasons that Don shared as well, like this conversion rate makes no sense and how can there be hunger in a world we're just not allocating our resources right so if we want to be compassionate to ourselves to our communities to the planet and to animals you know there's really easy and and tangible ways that we can have uh that impact and make those changes that's beautiful um we we do some interfaith uh, work as well there's a fantastic film that was uh, uh, recently released called The Prayer for Compassion. And we were involved, uh, Jewish Veg was involved in the making of the film. They interviewed multiple leaders uh, throughout the different faiths and how all of these different faiths traditions are pointing us to embrace a compassionate way and, uh, and a plant-based diet to, uh, for, for the sake of the animals and for the sake of compassion in the world. Um, so there is, there is a way to 
to have this conversation with, with different faiths um, and because all of the faiths share the same foundation of love and compassion for all of God's creatures. So that's uh, something that uh, uh, we'd, we'd be happy to, um, to, to work with you on that as well. Um, just, um, uh, I know we're kind of running uh, uh, close to the time. So anything else that uh, you guys want to add um, in terms of um, anything uh, that uh, uh, we, we should cover or any closing remarks um, that you want to make? Uh, since we are coming up on Earth Day, Earth Week, Earth Month, uh, check out Eco foodguide.org we have a it's a pdf that can be downloaded and we're going to hopefully have it in print we just got put off by the pandemic so uh, ecofoodguide.org it's a it's a really great resource and we have a lot of good sign-ons in terms of the earth day network and stuff, so share it memes Fantastic. Well, thank you so much. Um, I really appreciate all of your contributions. Um, everyone who's watching and who will watch later on, uh, please uh, check out uh, uh, A Well-Fed World, uh, the DCJCC, Planet Burger, as it's now being rebranded, uh, and, um, and of course, uh, the Food Empowerment Project. Uh, for all of um, your great and fantastic work, uh, that you are doing. Um, and uh, of course, uh, I want to encourage you to support uh, Jewish Veg and all of our work. All of this work exists um, through the support of members like you who invest in our mission. Um, so that link right at the bottom there, um, uh, jewishveg.org slash member to join uh, as a member of Jewish Veg. And um, just a reminder for that giveaway, um, if you want to uh, click the uh, link at the bottom of the description of the event and fill that out, you'll be, uh, uh, you'll be able to, uh, uh, you'll, you'll be in a drawing to win one of those wonderful options. Uh, and, your, uh, and your feedback is very important to us as well. Um, so with that, thank you so much for all of your great work and I look forward to continuing this conversation. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Thanks. Thank so you, Jewish Veg, for organizing this conversation. Thank you everyone for being here. Yes. So great. <laughs>